Welcome back to the podcast. You will be very familiar with my guest today. Elise Bassine is joining me for, I don't know, maybe the third time. I don't know how many Something times. Something like that. This. Yeah. I'm so happy to have you back and we're approaching the end of the year of 2023 and it's quite remarkable how many changes we've experienced this year. Oh my God. So many changes. Mm -hmm. I don't even, it's funny because you just said about, we started the year with the book that we, that we co-authored. And when you said that, I was like, that felt like a complete lifetime ago. I think it was. I think if you haven't, too. if you haven't gotten the book yet, it's called Akashic Wisdom. It's a channeled text. It's co-authored by Elise is in it. And I am Jennifer Longmore led the project. Christina Rice is in it and just several other really wonderful, wonderful people um, who are in the book with really clear messages around what's to come in the future. And so we had the book come out first. And what I wanted to do today was to do a year in review because I think that it's really important. This is going to be coming out right around the solstice. And it's just a time of reflection as the light is returning. And you and I both are clear channels and we have our channels with us. I'm the sun and you're the moon. I'm Soleil and you're Luna. And um, you have your selenite as well. So yes. I know that our channels will pop in here too, because they have a lot to say about not just the past year, but I think where we are headed in the future as well. So welcome back, Elise. Thank you. And Selena uh, says we're headed into the divinity era. And I actually have a new, I have like a short uh, channeled course that I'm dropping in January called Divinity Era. <laughs> and I'm really excited about it. That is amazing. I want to take yeah. that course because <laughs> one of the things I know that you're so good at is downloading beautiful short courses. Usually they're short courses. Some of them are more lengthy, but one of the things I've noticed this year is that my tolerance for long ex drawn out things just is it's gone. Totally. You know, it's funny. I, so my, uh, my flagship program, the metamorphosis, which is like my core body of work, it used to be six months long. And I actually just made it two months long because I realized that it doesn't need to take people that long to clear their familial and ancestral trauma. It can be done in two months now. So now the, the course is two months and now it's filling up like crazy. And it's like, oh, well, that's all that needed to happen is we just needed to make it shorter because it doesn't need to take six months anymore. It probably never did. But when we look we at- We just thought it did. We thought it did. And when we look at the models in, in business, especially around coaching, it's they've always been containers of six months or a year. And I think that we unconsciously get into a rhythm that somebody else set. Yes. And one of the things that I know has shifted for me this year is just reclaiming my own rhythm, my own body rhythms, my own natural rhythm, and then the rhythm of my business as well, which has always been one to move faster. I've had four month programs before and, and so on and shorter programs, but then there is that sort of pressure from the external world, we'll say in social media about what the leaders are doing and how the leaders are showing up and so on. And as light leaders ourselves, we actually get to set the tone for how we're going to be doing our programs. Yes. And we get to innovate. You know, I feel like that's been one of the biggest things for me this year is realizing that I'm actually meant to lead this movement of, you know, channeling for your business and not only channeling what you are sharing or teaching, but also channeling the way that you're teaching it. Like, for example, this program, Divinity Era, it's going to be content drop. So instead of me getting on a Zoom call with you and teaching you, I'm recording something and then I'm dropping it in the portal and you can listen to it when you want to. And to me, like that's how I enjoy to not only give content, but also consume it. So why wouldn't I create something based on the way that I like to consume content? So to me, it's like that, that feels so supportive to me. And I'm, you know, it's just a way of doing it that I enjoy. So I'm going to do it that way, you know? And it's like, I think it's like getting out of, like you said, th this idea that, you know, you have to do it this way, or you have to like get on a zoom call or whatever, because quite frankly, I'm tired of zoom calls. 
<laughs> like I only want to get on a zoom call if it's like something very like, you know, I'm going to be getting coaching with my mentor or you know what I mean? Like, I yes. don't need a, a zoom call to be for just content. No, you should be able to listen to it asynchronistically because that's how we, that's how we take in podcasts. I don't like the word consume. It feels sort of vampiristic to me. So yeah, I may yeah, yeah. stop using that, but I think the, I think just taking it in and receiving what you want to receive, receive the transmission. Yes. When it, when you, the it's appropriate for you to receive it rather than having to meet up at a certain time or something like that. I will say yeah. for me, I like the gathering portion of mm -hmm. it. Like I'm doing uh, a winter solstice gathering in my Facebook group, becoming the channel. And I like that. I like calling people together and imagining us sitting around a big kitchen table and, and lighting candles and pouring wine and, and enjoying each other's company. And since we can't do that for the most part, um, you know, in, in real life, I think that the next best thing is the virtual engagement. Not that it all yeah. has to be like that, but I think for special occasions, it is important to have that gathering space. Absolutely. I love that too. For certain spaces, mm -hmm. you know, and then, but for someone like me also that constantly has 50 ideas about programs, <laughs> um, not all of them get to be Zoom calls. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I'm like, I have way too many ideas and way too many like things that I teach that I'm just like, okay, we need to like streamline this in a way that is going to work for me so I can get it all out there. That's a lot of hair and makeup to do if you've always got to be ready for a Zoom call. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's, you guys, if you want to know behind the scenes of two channels, this is, this is how we roll. Welcome to it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Should we tell oh, them about yeah. our time, our time thing? Cause time has changed. Oh too. yeah. Arizona yeah, yeah, yeah. is mountain standard time always. That's where I am. At least is on the East coast. And when we decided to do this, we agreed 1130 East coast time. And both of us thought it was 830 <laughs> in Arizona. So when I messaged her this morning and said, let's go, it's eight, it was 835 my time. And she's like, oh, I thought it was. <laughs> and it was 1035 my time. So I thought I had an hour. <laughs> yes. And I wished that I had an hour because I was up channeling at 4 a.m. this morning and needed a little bit of extra rest. So it all worked out. But I think to our point is that you and I have this thing about time that has shown up in our relationship and our in our businesses as we've going been going through this year. So let's start back at the beginning. First quarter, January, February, March, we had the book come out. And that really, the Akashic Wisdom book really to me just kind of kicked off the the tone for the year in terms of what I would be focusing on. How did you, how did that book go for you? Like, what was your It's process? funny. It's funny. So for me, it, it, and this is how things go for me, right? Like I literally never oh. um, do things in advance. I never plan things, but once I have a container for something, I like know exactly, like I just need the container, right? So if you give me the container of the book, I'm going to know exactly what to say. And it's just a matter of me sitting down and allowing it to come through. And I did that maybe, you know, like two days before it was due or something like that, because that's how I am. I literally like when I do a transmission for a program or something, I'll do it like an hour before. And it's not that I'm necessarily like procrastinating, quote unquote. It's more because like, that's when I feel closest to the energy of it. You know what I mean? So it's mm -hmm. like more like uh, I can tune into exactly what needs to be said um, because it's like cl I'm close to it, if, th if that makes sense somehow. Yes, but that's how it a, feels to me. It's a crucible. And that's a word that... Mm -hmm that Marisol, my channel has been using for the program that I'm having right now, which is basically filling your, your programs, your high ticket programs in eight weeks or less. Mm -hmm. But, um, the crucible that we talk about, whether it's in that program or your experience is just, it's a, it's a container that holds high heat. Mm. And so that when we 
have these ideas, these these containers that we want to put something into, want to channel something into, it really is important to have the heat and the pressure in order to bring it forward, in order to create something new. And what's interesting about that is because as kids, I'm sure I got in trouble all the time for procrastinating, for waiting until the last minute, but in, <laughs> but it turns out that that was actually my channel all along. Yes, I feel the same exact way. I'm sorry. Noah is like freaking out right now. I have no idea why. Hi, Noah. I don't know why he's freaking out. He's like, all of his needs are met. Like, do you he hear just him? wants to say hello Ooh. on the podcast. Hi, here, Noah. Do you want to say hi? Come here. Come here. We we'll have a you special appearance by on. Noah. Come say hi. You want to come say hi? Come on. Come on. There he is. There's Noah. <laughs> hi, buddy. <laughs> But I'm going to have to shut the door on you. Hold on. I'm sorry. Let me just shut. It's okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. I think Um, it's super funny. Our pets are so connected to us. Cooper, (laughs) whenever I'm on a call, my private clients know this. Whenever I say something or something comes through and Cooper barks, they all respond and Cooper agrees because for some reason (laughs) (laughs) his timing is impeccable I feel like there's some kind of like energy that we are obviously like creating right now that he's responding to because like I literally just walked him for almost three miles he's fed like there's no like you know Mm -hmm. so it's it's interesting he just wanted to say hello he's our yeah he's our wolf one of our Our resident wolf yeah Cooper even (laughs) though he's a golden doodle he has some wolf in him as well. I tell him it's time to go to work and guard the perimeter. And he does, he'll come in my office Mm -hmm. and sit in his chair or lay on the floor and just be with me. It's very sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And important, I think. I agree. So, yeah. So let's get back to the crucible and to the, the criticism that I think a lot of us had as children, as creatives, as intuitives, and ultimately as channels is you're waiting till the last minute, you're procrastinating. And then what I found with the book was I had that same tape going through my head. Me too. Even though, <laughs> <laughs> even though for I, I channeled both of my chapters when I was in Sedona and I ended up, the way that I wrote the chapters was to verbally transmit them. I had lovely conversation with Seraphis Bay and just, um, I forget who else I, oh, the Lemurian High Council were the mm-hmm. the two beings who are groups that I was channeling at the time and wanted to have a conversation with me about some things going on in the world. And I did those both from Sedona and I had pressure even, well, maybe I should type it mm-hmm. versus just speak it and then um, transcribe it, which ultimately is where I decided to go on that. I I just typed it. Um, but yeah, it just literally, as soon as I sat down, it just came out. And that's really how I channel a lot of the time is, especially if it's for something specific is I just sit down and I have, like, I know what I'm channeling for. I know what the container is. Like there has to be a container. It's almost like, you know, how with mother Malia, she'll say like, ask me questions and then I'll be able to tell you. It's very similar to that where it's like, if I have a container with a focus and like a question or, you know, like an intention, then it just pours in. But if I don't have that, then it's like, I just, am, then I'm just like everything. What am I supposed <laughs> you know? to, like, I yeah. always ask, what am I supposed to talk about? That's yeah, one of the reasons exactly. why I wanted to have you on the podcast today because, um, Marisol wanted to do an end of the year review, but she likes, it's the same. It's that maybe it's being a generator in human design or something like that. I think you're a manifesting generator, but whatever, Mm -hmm. like however you want to describe it, we're connected beings and we like to talk to each other. And I think the interesting, the conversation gets more interesting as well. Yeah. And the other thing I've been thinking about too, is I've been listening to this book about, um, like basically like quantum physics. And I know we we've talked about the word quantum, <laughs> but like for lack of a better word, it it's literally about quantum physics. And I'm fascinated by quantum physics just because it's like 
the science of spirituality, right? So we're going to put a link in the in the show notes to the episode on why we're not using the word quantum anymore. Um, because yes. there's a reason for that, but that there's is the word there, that is the word that is still being used a lot, obviously, especially yeah. in science. And I don't think this person is using it in a, like, I think they're just in a nefarious, use, yeah. yeah. In a nefarious but way. anyway, what he was saying was, is, you know, it, from this theory, this like quantum physics theory, or, you know, I don't even think it's a theory. I think they've proven it is that nothing exists without it being observed, right? So the the observation is the thing, right? So when we end, nothing exists without being witnessed, right? So that's why as channels, we need a container, we need like each other, because we're literally witnessing each other and that's how we're bringing this information to life. So I, it's funny because I've been thinking about that all morning because I've been listening to this book and I'm like, wow, isn't that interesting that, you know, we need to be witnessed in order to like create, Yeah. even though we also don't want to create just to be witnessed, right? And it it's, it's a, anyway, it's not, I yes, I get it. It's not, <laughs> it's not performative. And I think that right. that's the thing, like, I don't want to be a performance monkey who, mm -hmm. you know, tell me what, you know, tell me what you see for my future or anything like that. It's not that no. at all. It just is, there is, um, there's a spice to it when we get together and it's yes. so much more engaging and so much more interesting, I think. And, yes. um, so, yeah, so this is, this is an interesting thing that we're exploring with, when it comes to being channels and really understanding our gifts both of us have had this ability our whole lives. And yet in the last year, it really has for both of us opened up. Oh, I know Q1 for me. Guess what? I started becoming mm. the channel, the podcast. Oh, yes. My first episode was March 16th of this, of this year. And I chose that day because that is the day way back in 2001, I think that my marriage ended. And it was one of those days that you know, it just hung with me for a long time. And I remember earlier this year thinking I had had a podcast previously, the Mindset RX, but I, when I decided to rename the podcast and go in this direction, I just decided I would reclaim that day. So mm, I love March that. 16th was the date of the first podcast of becoming the mm -hmm. channel. And it's funny because I became the channel this year. <laughs> I mean, you Weird. really, you <laughs> claimed it, you claimed yes. it in an even deeper way. I think, I think we both did. And I think a lot of people did, but you know, I will say for me, this year has been just such a roller coaster ride. Just, um, just with the things that happened, like in January, I, I met my brother for the first time, or That's I connected right. that with was my this brother year? for the first time. That was this year in January and talk about time. I feel that I've experienced this year so many timeline hops. Like, for example, meeting my brother, I feel like the reason why that happened is because I jumped into a different timeline through the ancestral healing and clearing that I've done. Because I think there was a point when the reality was that my brother did not, uh, have such a great life we'll put it that way <laughs> because I had seen this other timeline where you know he went into the system and it wasn't a great thing and f just to give a little background my mom had a baby that she gave up for adoption so I had seen that reality for a lot of my life and then as I did all of this clearing and healing around my ancestral lines it was like, boom, he popped in and it was like this timeline hop to this reality where he existed and is this amazing person and is deeply connected to our family. That happened right after, remember that terrible car accident that you got in? Yeah. The car accident was right after it. So okay. that was Monday and the car accident was Thursday, the same week. <laughs> it's 
<laughs> and the car accident was literally like, Ooh, we're pushing you in a new direction, you know? Yeah. Another timeline hop, probably. Another timeline hop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, it really, I, I feel like I really just got pushed in an entirely new direction this year. And I don't know how else to explain it other than that, where I was really shown like just these completely different ways of re relating to myself and the world um, and really transcending all of these old paradigms of fear, scarcity, anxiety that I didn't even realize I was really living in until I, you know, was kind of pushed out of it and forced to do things differently. And that's what I feel like this year was partially about for me, along with the channeling stuff too. I mean, it really opened up, you know, things started to open up a lot when I channeled for the book because that kind of, um, the information that came through, like that wasn't the first time I channeled obviously, but for whatever reason, the information that came through sparked a bunch of the work that I ended up doing throughout the year. And then when we went to Palm Springs, that was kind of like another point where I was blown away by what I was able to see and what we all channeled there, that that just put me on another level where I was like, holy shit, like this stuff that we're able to do and what we're, we were able to tune into just completely blew my mind. And we did a podcast right after. Oh we yeah. From Palm Springs. So we're <laughs> yeah. going to put a link into the show notes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because that was a wild ride. And I wanted to get into that a little bit because um, that was another, I was, you used the word roller coaster. And I was just thinking about highs and lows mm -hmm. of the year. And I don't, when I think about lows, I don't think that for me anyway, I didn't have a lot of like, there was nothing devastating or anything that happened this year, just so much as maybe it's more like highs and lulls. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I definitely feel like there was a lot of emotional clearing. There was a lot of like, you know, when I had that accident, it set me into, I had a few like bad anxiety spells after that accident um, that I would, you know, consider a low, like it wasn't a low, like anything terrible happened, but it was just like an emotional low. Um, oh, remember so we, when we did that work after, because one of yes. you, guys, you guys, one of the things that I can do, that was a near death experience for you, first mm -hmm. of all. And I've talked about that recently, but one of the things that happens with car accidents is your consciousness pops out of your body. And if you don't call it all the way back into your body, you can have it. It looks like PTSD or, um, at least PTSD is a longer term thing, but acute stress related mm -hmm. to trauma. And so there's this methodology that I, that I have that just pulls you back in. And then you can move forward from that because you're not constantly reliving, going back to the scene. What I find is that when you're returning to the scene over and over, it's because a part of your consciousness is still sort of locked in there yes. and needs to be recovered so that you can move forward. And I so, have to say that was so powerful like that really worked and it really changed things and it happened within like five minutes like I think mm -hmm. the whole thing was like five minutes yeah it didn't take it long it doesn't really, have to take long no but it just like really helped me like move forward from that and not you know be like kind of in this loop which I didn't even realize I was in and I think that's the problem too sometimes when we have trauma is the way that it manifests in the body and in the being, you don't realize it. And I think that's the thing that, you know, is, is something that's important for people to understand. And also why, you know, we are so adamant about being trauma informed and what trauma really is and actually being well-versed in it, because it shows up in ways that you, you yourself wouldn't recognize if you were playing it out. And most people wouldn't recognize, you know, so it takes a skillfulness to be able to recognize that. And I didn't, I didn't realize it for myself. And I'm like, probably one of the most well-versed people in trauma around, you know, yeah. and it took you being like, uh, 
hello. <laughs> well, and that's why it's so important to have people who you trust to be able to be able to see into your life. Right. So that, yeah. because we, when you have each other's backs, there are just things in my life that I can't see either because I'm in it. Yeah. And at least you've always been my, you're my go-to for what is actually going on. Oh, I love to what tell is actually you what's going, actually going on. Just tune in here just tune <laughs> in and see what's going on and then move that. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, yeah. So Palm Springs was another turning point, I think. And mm -hmm. I would say another timeline jump as well, because you guys in Palm Springs, it was really an opportunity for a group of us to come together and to um, understand what we're actually up against energetically, spiritually, um, as we are moving into the divinity era, as Elise is calling it. And I love that because there is a lot of um, nonsense that's been happening. And I think here's the thing. Here's what I, I was when I was walking Cooper this morning, Marisol and I were chatting and she wanted me to talk about, she wanted us to talk about what it means to be a clear channel. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, the reason behind this is that she's bringing this forward now is because you can look at the world and see a version of the world and assume that people are telling the truth and assume that things are exactly as they seem. But what I have found this year as my channel has completely opened and cleared that I'm seeing things in new ways and there's a discernment about what the actuality is, what mm -hmm. the, and what's been hidden versus what is being presented as, as truth. Yeah. So can I, um, let's, let's just get into this with what's a clear channel from your end, from your perspective. To me, it's about being able to see like the highest level of truth. Um, and in order to do that, it really requires a level of like self-awareness first and foremost. Um, and it also requires a willingness to, you know, see things that might be uncomfortable for you to see. And I think that that first and foremost, I think is one of the things that can block a lot of people. The other thing that I think is, is a big piece of this is, it takes a certain level of responsibility. And I don't mean responsible for like other people. I mean, like self-responsibility um, because you kind of have to be willing to take accountability for everything in your life that you've created, right? And you have to have like this level of like being able to own that. You know, it's funny, last night I did a and a call for people that were interested in my certification, my breathwork certification. And one of the women, as I was, I'm talking about the program and I love talking about it. So I'll get like really into it where I'm like, I take this very seriously. Like I take, like we have a very high level of integrity around here. Like, you know, I'm like going off and she's like, she, this one woman was like, it just seems like a lot of responsibility. You know, and I was like, well, yes, yes, you know, you're not responsible for other people, but you are responsible for yourself and being able to discern between your projections, your triggers, like you have to know yourself really well, because if you don't, then you're just going to be projecting all over the place. And that's the thing that you know, what that drives me crazy on the internet is you just see people like projecting all over each other and being triggered by things and responding from a trigger, but not even knowing they're triggered. And I'm just like, come on, people, like a little more self-awareness here. Like you're triggered, you're projecting, like you have more. to be able, yeah, like you have to be able to know those things about yourself um, because and and be able to like put those things aside in order to tune into this higher level of truth. So I think that piece of it is really, really important. And I would say for me, that's why I feel like I'm such a clear channel is because I have a very high level of self-awareness. And the other piece of it too, is 
you have to have the ability to hold multiple perspectives at the same time. And you have to have the ability to not be attached to any of those perspectives. Like, you know, I can listen to somebody talk that I completely don't necessarily agree with, quote unquote, but be open to their opinion and be completely neutral about it. And you have to be able to do that. Because I, if you let's don't... talk about let's talk about neutrality, because this is something okay. that this year for me has become sort of my my go to to be at the level of neutrality does not mean that you don't care about things. It means that you can hold multiple perspectives with curiosity and without judgment. It's actually mm -hmm. the Buddhist practices of mindfulness to pay attention on purpose with an open heart and without judgment. That is in essence, neutrality. Mm -hmm. And so when we are in a neutral place, that means that we have, to your point, been able to take note of our triggers and hopefully untangle the trauma knots in our field. And I, I, we do that in our my McKay actualization method. There's an untangling that we can do within our bioenergy fields in order to clear the, the uh, trauma and restore the consciousness to its rightful home in your heart. But the neutrality for me really means that I get to be curious about everything. And it is hard, especially in the closest relationships. I think it's very hard to remain neutral, but yes. largely at the world, in the world at large, when you're, if you're watching a news cycle or if you are a movie or something like that, to be able to walk in a neutrality and just be curious about oh, well, this is interesting that Nicole Kidman is promoting AMC theory, uh, theaters. And wow, she looks quite a bit like a vampire, for example. I'm not attached to that, but <laughs> in fact. <laughs> in fact, she does. And, and one of my gifts as a channel is that I see people for, I see their essences. So as an example of this, Elise, I was at the gym last week, I think, or the week before training with Justin. And I look over and I see this guy and I said to Justin, that's a Vulcan. He's, he's like a Star Trek guy. And Justin looks over and he starts laughing and he agrees with me. He's not, <laughs> he's just a, you know, he's just a trainer, but he, and he hears a lot about my, my, my escapades in, in spirituality, but he got it. So any, to my point. The neutrality piece, I think, is is a big piece of being the clear channel, because in neutrality you can actually discern truth yes. from truth from falsity. You can discern the way forward without being caught in the in the weeds of should I go here or should I go there or I'm confused or I'm uncertain or whatever it is. And the other thing I just want to add to this for clarity is. It doesn't mean that you can't have triggers. It doesn't mean that you can't have feelings about things or emotions about things or get upset by things, but you just have to be able to separate that out. Like you have to be able to recognize that for what it is, separate it out and not allow it to create like a lens through which you look at things, you know, so you can be aware, like, like I just had this happen this morning. I was really triggered by my husband, which I talked to you about yesterday. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like I am not, I, I'm feeling this emotion right now. I'm allowing myself to feel this emotion, but I'm not going to bring this into anything else that's going on today, right? I'm not going to bring it into this like conversation. I'm taking my daughter shopping later. I'm not going to bring it there. Or if like, you know, even, even when it comes to him, right, I'm not going to even uh, to the best of my ability, allow it to cloud how I even relate to him, because I know as being a clear channel and also understanding the nature of reality, that the best service I can do for him is to see him as his highest self, because that's only going to benefit him. And it feels a lot better for me. So I'm going to see him in his highest potential versus like going down into the weeds with him or allowing what he's doing to trigger my whatever stuff, right? So I think that's a very big piece of this, just as an example of being able to navigate what is happening for you and understand it so that you can 
put it to the side when it comes to being able to see truth and being able to tune in to higher levels of truth. Yes. <laughs> The difference is psychological responsibility. And when part of being a clear channel is also extracting yourself from the victim, persecutor, rescuer triad. Yes. And so yes. you can be, you can have an exchange. I, 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 if you guys are watching the video, you saw me go same with when <laughs> Elise mentioned that she had a thing with her husband this morning and I had that experience as well. And um, when you are caught in the victim persecutor rescuer triad that is when that there's a lingering of those experiences there's a lingering of the energy of i'm a victim in this how dare he i'm insulted i'm pissed off whatever it is why and is this happening why is this why happening why is this keep happening <laughs> i just can't even whatever and even as i as i feel into the energy right now the energy is clean and that's a very different experience from maybe a couple of years ago where I would have been able to compartmentalize, but it would have taken up a whole lot more energy and, and mental space in order to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it, that's just, it's just something that you practice and you get better at. But I think, I think it's important too, to spend a little time in the victim thing because this is something that can be re really triggering for people. And I talk about this a lot on my Instagram and I always get, like, I can always tell when I post something and I'm like, I'm going to get some angry person telling me why it's not her fault that like her husband fell ill or whatever, you know, like that type of thing. And, um, and yes, like I get that. And also there's things that happen in life that, are seemingly beyond our control and you would think oh well I would never have wanted that to happen but there's also these larger energies at play right so uh, and and this is another piece around being a channel is you have to be able to see things from a higher wider energetic perspective and not take them literally right so this is one of the things that you know I teach people when I'm teaching them how to pinpoint trauma is like, we're not taking it literally. So if I'm saying you're playing out your relationship with your mom, people will tend to take that literally being like, well, my mom was like this and it wasn't like this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not literal. We're zooming out and we're looking at the energy and the energetics and the patterns of energy. And typically they'll be the exact same thing. And typically with most people, there's like one or two patterns of energy that are playing out in every single area of their life, it just looks, the details are different, the specifics are different, the energy is the same, right? So we have to be able to zoom out and look at energy. And from that perspective, yes, there are no victims, right? But we don't always understand why certain things happen from our human perspective. But it's interesting because this is something that always triggers people because they're very attached to you know, not being in full control of their lives, because that would mean a whole lot more responsibility, right? A so I think a whole that's lot why, more responsibility. Yeah. And I think that's why people resist that, but it can be so tempting to go into this victim mentality. And, you know, I think people confuse like elevating beyond that with letting go of, you know, somebody hurting you or somebody, or when you were wronged by somebody, it's like, well, if I let this go, then it's saying it, that it's okay. And it's like, no, we're not saying it's okay. But what we are saying is that being in a victim energy, it's not a contribution to you going anywhere. And it's not a contribution to you being in your power. So from that perspective, you can't get anywhere in that energy. That energy is not going to get you anywhere. It's completely powerless energy. So you have to elevate beyond it in order to be able to move forward from a place of power. So I think that that's an important distinction too, because it's not saying that that thing that happened wasn't terrible or you weren't hurt or you weren't traumatized. It's just saying in this energy, we're not moving. We're not going anywhere. We're not growing. 
it's a you get caught in a time loop when you're in the energy of why did this happen to me and you and i both know as trauma-informed specialists that um that is it it's it can be a journey the journey can be hastened with the energy the energetic work of course and then we have to also look at when when we are clearing our channel we have to look at the stuff that we're putting in our bodies yes so one of the things that I've done, you've been vegetarian for a long time, and I'm largely vegetarian yeah. at this point. Um, but how has for you, and I'll answer this too, but how has your diet, like what you're putting in your body shifted this year? It's interesting because I've had such a journey with this. I struggled, you know, when I was a older teenager with an eating disorder and then from that point kind of went down this whole rabbit hole of like different ways of eating and all of this stuff. So this has been such a journey for me and it's always been a largely, uh, you know, triggering topic for me. So for me personally, I feel like this year has been a big healing from that mm -hmm. and and what that has started to look like for me is much more just like listening to my body and eating intuitively. And, you know, and I just have been guided to be vegetarian. You know, I think I became vegetarian at 18 and I never really like thought about it. It just like I, the, the way that I became vegetarian was I just was like, oh, wow, I haven't eaten meat in a really long time. I must be vegetarian. So it wasn't even like a decision that I made. I wasn't like, hey, everyone, I'm becoming vegetarian. It just happened naturally. And it was something that I just wasn't really drawn to eating meat. So I didn't. Um, but, but now I've gotten to this point where I just like listen to what my body wants. And I and, and that's been a lot of it for me, but, and, and that's for me personally, because I feel like for so long, I was so much, I overthought and over controlled like everything about eating. And it became like this thing that it wasn't supposed to be. So now I feel like for this year, what's really happened for me is like this restoration around that. It's funny. I have not, I haven't put words to this yet. I'm glad you asked this question. Cause I haven't like, I kind of knew this on an energetic level, but I didn't like say it to myself ever. So, but I do feel like that happened this year is I just, it was kind of like this restoration of just a healthy relationship with food of, Oh, this is what I want right now. And this is what I'm going to have you know, and it's, it's a journey. It's not perfect, but that's how it is for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, um, you know, and that usually just looks like me eating mostly healthy stuff. You know, I don't ever really eat like, you know, occasionally here and there stuff, but like, it's funny. Cause my, I always joke that like, people will be like, Oh, is that good? And I'm like, well, I think it's good. But like, I'm so used to eating <laughs> like healthy food that like, I think something that is like junk food, somebody else would think is like healthy food, you know? So I feel like I'm not always a good judge of that. Yes. Well, the palate, I think changes as you become more clear. And mm -hmm. I will say that for me, I stopped eating meat at the beginning of the pandemic. And it had to do with, there was a, there was an outbreak of the, um, the disease in the, the meat packing plants. And oh, at yeah. that point I was just like, you know what? I think I'm good. I think I'm good. And I haven't looked back at that, but I will tell you at least that when Marisol came in, in, it's been a little bit over two months now, that is when everything changed in my diet. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I was a consummate coffee drinker. And I had my creamer, you know, my favorite, don't talk to me about my creamer. <laughs> <laughs> I had protein shakes that I, all of these things up until that point. And there is a definite before and after, and now I am a consummate tea drinker. So I know that this is Marisol because this is mm -hmm. my husband is like, why, 
what what happened so yeah so there are certain things that have shifted for me in the last couple of months that are definitely related to this new consciousness that I'm that I'm very connected with Marisol and I think that that's an interesting thing because it's very clear that this consciousness has preferences and mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. And it just feels normal to me. It was never, there was never any pressure. I didn't think, Oh, one day I'm just going to wake up and start drinking tea. It just was yeah. sort of a natural progression. And I think that every once in a while I'll try to have a cup of coffee and it just is, it feels thick and heavy in my body. And I think that my body is just wanting more light. And so I'm eating a lot of macadamia nuts, which mm -hmm. I'm loving and um, grazing more than, you know, sitting down and consuming an entire meal. And because I love horses, of course, you can see why I would be grazing like the horses do all day yeah. long, rather than taking in one full meal three times a day, for example. So I think that one of the things in, in the journey to becoming a clear channel is reconnecting or reestablishing your natural biorhythms that are going to look different mm -hmm. from mine or Elisa's or who, you know, name the names, because we've had this, this myth about the circadian rhythm that, you know, people have to do things at a certain time and eat at a certain time and eat certain meals. And those are all, um, what do I want to say? Those are all prescriptive from somebody or something outside of us. And in the journey to becoming the clear channel, it's really reestablishing your own connection with your inner knowing about what is best for you. I've also been spending a whole lot of time in the sunshine to no great surprise, <laughs> taking in a lot. I think, I think I'm feeling so energized because of all the time I'm spending in the sun and I'm not wearing sunglasses doing that because that seems to be very helpful for my energy body as well. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause I, you know, the energy that I've been channeling, Selena works with the energy of the moon and I've been getting so much information in the middle of the night. Like it's, it's almost like regular where I will like get woken up in the middle of the night and, um, get like downloads and information, like the whole, everything that I'm teaching in my program, the sacred six figure initiation, which is about channeling for your business. All of that came to me in the middle of the night where it was like, here are all the concepts here, are like all the new paradigm business concepts that you're going to teach. And it all came to me between like one and five in the morning, one night. <laughs> so. That is wonderful. <laughs> and that's so unusual because usually in the past, maybe you would have received that information at a different time or in a different way. And mm -hmm. so in reconnecting with your channel um, and sorting out your own body's rhythms and how things work, then you can be okay with being up from one until five in the morning. And it's not a, <laughs> it's not a, um, an inconvenience, but more a gift. And I think that that's an important yeah. piece of the puzzle because, you know, where, you know, I look at what you're doing with Selena, your, your channel and with the, the new era of business and money that's coming in. And I know that Marisol and I are here for the channels to make sure that people are clear and psychologically well so that they can channel the big energies and so that they can have access to their own wisdom that's available to them, but that gets muddied. The waters get muddied. Let's be honest yes. in this. I was at a movie last night and I'm so sensitive now to the energetics of what's going on. And this is when we were talking about holding a, holding the space of neutrality. I was noticing all of these things about, I had to leave at one point because the frequencies that they were sending out in the music were so disruptive to me that I was starting to get a headache. Mm -hmm. And then I used your trick, which was to coat everything in honeycomb. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then I was able to be in the space without being affected by the space. But those are things that for me that are important. And, I, and I'm learning so much about our environment because the more I know about how to adjust the environment so that mm -hmm. we can have clarity, because there's a lot of, um, we'll say transmissions coming through that are evoking confusion, uncertainty worry, fear, all of those lower frequencies that I would say on the spectrum of frequency are going to be the lower frequencies if neutral is, is like the zero point frequency. Yeah. Then we're looking at all of these frequencies that are coming through that are low that we are, we are deeply affected by as channels if we're not paying attention to it. And here's something that I'll know you want to talk about 
you'll want to add to is that those frequencies are contagious. So we receive them. We think that they're ours. And then there is a level of discernment that we have to have responsibility for to ask the question, is this mine or is this in the general etheric? Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think this is really important. And I think this is something that a lot of people are experiencing, but they don't have words for. It's funny on the call last night, that Q&A call I had, this woman said, I was so drawn to your work because you, you know, she found me on Instagram and she's like, because you are putting names to these things that I feel, but I didn't have words for them. Right. And I think that that's a lot of people's experience right now is they're like, I know that I am feeling other energies. I know that I'm feeling other people's energy, but I'm not sure what's mine and what is somebody else's. So I think that's, first of all, a very important question to ask is, is this mine? And then immediately clear other people's energy from your field. And that's something that I teach first and foremost to my students and my certification is like, (laughs) typically if you are, if you clear other people's energy from your field, you're most likely going to feel like 85% better, if not a hundred percent. But if the problem, if, you know, the quote unquote problem or the issue is in fact you, then you will, you know, still have like 15% more to do. But if it's other people, which is, is a lot. And, you know, you know, I live in the city and there's so much energy here and, you know, I have to be really just aware, right. With my energy. And when I'm like walking around, just like taking on other people's energy, or sometimes I'll be walking around and all of a sudden I'll get a wave of like fear or anxiety or whatever. And usually it's not mine, you know, or usually like I'll see like, yeah, I'll see all of these visions because Philadelphia is like, it's totally haunted here, by the way. Like there's so much, <laughs> there's so much like stuff going on here. And I realize like why I'm here, but there's so much. And I'll see visions of like violent things happening or, you know, and like, I just have to like be aware that that is not mine. And I am constantly like just clearing my energy, putting myself in my bubble. But also like, I am aware from this other perspective that as like part of the energy of Selena and this energy of the moon is like transmuting the darkness. And not that I'm taking that on as like my Elisa's job, right? But there is a way where just shining the light on that is a way that we transmute the darkness. And that's like part of the energy that I specifically work with. And that's why I'm like drawn to that. Like I'm, I'm automatically drawn to like, okay, what is, what's here that we we're not seeing. Right. And how can we put words to the things that we can't see? And by doing that, we literally bring it into the light. To illuminate. We illuminate it by naming it, you know? So Mm. that, and that's part of what I love to do is just like naming things that you can maybe feel or sense, but you can't see and you don't have words for. So I think that that's, you know, that's part of it, but at the same time, you have to be able to hold a very solid energetic frequency so that you're not taking on the energy of other people. And that starts with you and being able to like be the one who's leading energy, you know? So I always say that being able to do energy work is actually a way that we take our power back because it's a way that you are able to say, no, actually I'm in charge here, right? Like I'm the one who's in charge. I'm the one who's going to be leading here. This is the energy I want to feel. This is the energy I want to create. And this is the energy I'm going to hold. So instead of just being somebody who's feeling all the energies and reacting to it, you're the one who's leading the energy, right? This is where the energy is going. And I'm the one in the driver's seat creating that. So I think that's kind of the paradigm shift of the way that we have to think about it. Um, instead of just being like, well, I feel this and I don't know what, you know, cause then it's kind of like, you're all over the place. Well, yes. And this is, this is so good. You're bringing this forward because in the service of the channels and understanding what it means to be a clear channel, it is that we are leaders and not just telling people what to do, but leading the energy or conducting the energy. Mm -hmm. 
And yes. that also requires a level of responsibility for yourself and for the energy that you are calibrating to. Mm -hmm. And so does that make sense? Yeah, no. And I was just going to say, like, it's something that is not easy at first that you really have to practice. And you also have to be willing to trust that you can do that, right? Because we, this is like very much opposite of the way that we've been indoctrinated. And it's funny, you know, cause I, I know I keep referring to this book that I'm listening to, but it's inside my head. He was talking about language and how language is actually part of like the indoctrination mm -hmm. of what reality is, mm -hmm. right? So it's so infused within us that, you know, we are, there's things happening. There's like some kind of objective reality happening outside of us that we're not in control of. And that's not actually true per quantum physics, right? So we have to be able to understand that and trust and know in our ability to lead and create the energy that we desire to create. I feel like that's a mic drop. <laughs> let's um let's do it back and forth with selena and marisol okay. okay so marisol is the soleil she's the sun and selena is the moon so of course elise and i would be together on this journey <laughs> <laughs> so will you ask will you start and ask the questions of Marisol that you would love to know about the sun or about the channels or whatever. And that would be helpful. Yes. Okay. So, um, what is it that we actually need to know about powerfully working with the energy of the sun? Well, there are a couple of things that we need to understand. One is that this sun in this planet that we're living on is actually a we'll call it a way station for Soleil. Mm. And so all of the suns are connected. And actually on the last podcast I did with Miriam, the galactic astrologer, we talk about this and she has information about this as well, that all of the suns are connected to the central sun. And this is where I channel from is the central sun. This is where I am from. And so in terms of the frequencies that you need to pay attention to, I think that the guiding, the guiding point here is that the sun is here. Our sun even is just here to support us as humans. And we are being told regularly to stay out of the sun or just get a little bit of sun or something like that. And that is not true. That is something that is made to keep us out of the light. So get into the sunshine. And yes, I know in the colder climates where the sun goes down early and there's a lot of darkness, especially this time of year, because we're coming up on the, on the winter solstice where sunlight is at a minimum, it's still important to give yourself the opportunity to be in the sunshine. What, what I do is I go out without my sunglasses every day. I don't wear sunglasses anymore. I haven't for two and a half months ever since this transition happened for me. And I give myself sun in my, the center of my forehead, on my temples, and on the top of my head, and then also in my heart. And I just really appreciate being in the sunshine. And that, I think, is a really important thing. You can find your own way through this, but sometimes you have to also look at what are the biases that I have against the sun. And often the biases that we have against the sun are biases that show up in our own lives, in our marketing, don't shine too brightly. Don't, don't just be yourself in the world. The sun is always herself. Soleil is always herself. She doesn't have an agenda in terms of making anybody feel less bright or anything like that. She just shines. And so I think that we can take this for our businesses and the marketing that we do is that can we just shine like the sun without apology? Yes, I love that. Um and it's, it's funny, that's a message that I keep getting to of just like shining my light. Like that's all mm -hmm. that I need to do. Yes. And um, you, because the moon, of course, does the same thing. Mm -hmm. The moon is the, the brightest body in the night sky mm -hmm. by far. And so the same is true, right? With the moon is to be the brightest light in the night sky. Yeah. 
Yeah. The other thing I was thinking of asking Marisol is, um, like, is there anything that you feel like we really need to know for moving into 2024? Oh, there's so much. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's a lot. That was a broad question. Well, here's the thing about, about being a light leader is that you have to know yourself. And you can no longer look externally to other people's projections of how you're supposed to be. If you're going to work with somebody to find out who you are, make sure that they are clear on who they are so that they're not projecting onto you a cookie cutter version of them onto you. Um, and one of the things that I'm finding that I'm really seeing is that the thing that is stopping people from building their programs, from making their six figure months and all of those things that we like to talk about is that they are looking to people who are leaders, who are light leaders and who are in their power and who are clear channels. And they are emulating those of us who are. And there's that saying that flattery is Oh, imitation is imitation, the finest form of yeah. flattery, but in this yeah. case, it actually is a detriment because while we understand that you admire the leader's perspectives and how they're showing up in the world, what you're actually asking for is to show up in the world in your own way that is true to who you are. And you cannot do that if you are emulating another person's copy or how they're, they're photographing or anything like that. and. So this is a big, um, this is a, oh, I don't know what the word is to use, an area of growth, I think, for entrepreneurs is to no, stop the copycatting. And yes, it's very, and it's very sneaky, isn't it? It is. And I think it's important to differentiate and discern for yourself between being inspired by somebody or somebody like reflecting back to you a part of you that's there that you haven't allowed out yet right because that does happen and that's what's great about you know everyone in this field so i do think that that happens but it, it everything is about the energy that is behind it right yes. so if you're doing it from a place of well let me just do what she does because she is successful and I'm going to do what she does versus, oh, wow, she just like activated something within me that is truly authentic to me and wants to come through me, but I just didn't, I wasn't allowing it yet until it was activated. And now I'm going to go take that activation and let it integrate in me and then channel through, you yes. know, what wants to come through based yes. on that. So I think it's important to discern because we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater in the sense of like, you know, there is power in like watching other people and how they're moving and what they're doing because of what it shows you about yourself. But you just have to be able to discern between what is truly coming from within you and what is just emulating somebody else. And it has a different texture to it. And it is important to like reflect on for yourself and continue to like refine that uh, discernment and, and understanding the difference in those textures. It's definitely an area of growth and awareness. And I find that much of it is born from uncertainty about mm -hmm. what you're supposed to be doing, uncertainty about the message. And certainly I have had that experience myself. And I'm sure that you have too, when we look at the leaders or the look at the people that we admire and they're... <laughs> there seems to be a stickiness to it. It's almost like it's, it's its own sort of virus to be, <laughs> yeah. if, it, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. because you're meant, if you're meant to be a clear channel, then you have your own channel that that is going to flow through. And you can use to your point, use people as inspiration, but when you're using the language that they're using, or you're um, directly copying their you know, however they're showing up in the world. I remember long ago when Marie Forleo was all the rage and she had a, uh, she'd film her videos against a brick wall. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh my goodness, well, I should probably film my videos against a brick wall because I was, <laughs> that was very, that was a long time ago. But the point here, <laughs> I think that we want to make is that when it comes to, because I am here for the channels, I am here for the clarity of the channels. 
And I can assess very quickly if how clear somebody is, even on a on a percentile, I'll say um, how much they're channeling clarity. And um, so it is an area of growth and it, it's not to criticize, but it just is to bring awareness to it because when you are aware of it, you can shift it because totally. there is something, something important that you're meant to bring through, but you can't bring it through when it's cluttered by everyone else's messages and the comparisons and the uncertainties and all of the the um, early developmental stages of what it means to be a light leader. Th those are the things that have to be cleared or neutralized so that you can be a crystal clear channel. Yes. Is 100%. there anything else that you would like to know before we shift over to Selena? Um, I guess the last thing would be like, what would you say to somebody who's really wanting to like nurture and develop their channeling and cultivate like their channeling abilities? Yes. Well, you know, the, the first thing to do is really to understand yourself as a channel and understand your personality and how you're wired that way. And so, of course, we always recommend doing the NEO with, with Robin because that is the number one way to really truly understand how your channel is wired and how it is meant to come through. And it also is very instructive in terms of what needs to shift in your nervous system in particular in order to allow the information to come through clearly. The other thing that we would say is to make sure you get your spiritual intelligence codes activated because there is actually a neurological channel through which beings like Marisol, like me, flow, like Selena flow. And if that channel, that literal neurological channel is not fully restored, that is going to cause a disruption in the clarity of the channel. Learning to trust your channel, that is another big developmental stage that we're all going through right now. Even those of us who are just where we are, to trust the channel, to know that what's coming through is clear and true and accurate versus muddied and am I making it up in my head and am I going crazy? And I will end with this is that the uh, part of the crazy making is the mental health discussion on channeling. Am I channeling a demon or am I going to be viewed as a cult leader or am I going to be, be viewed as a charlatan? Like all of those things, those are things that are in the, the culture and in society and in our bones even. I think healing the witch wound is another one that is very important. Mm -hmm. and Robin never talks about the witch wound, but this is something we're going to be talking about because there is that generational and genetic history of, of intuitive channels being persecuted and killed or thrown into insane asylums because of their abilities beyond being misunderstood. It's been dangerous to be channels. And now more than ever, we are coming, we're here and more of us are coming forward. So this is an important conversation that we will be continuing into the new year. Thank yes. Asking um, questions, Elise, that was wonderful. I have a download for you. Oh yes, please. <laughs> Do you mind if I share it? Here? Yes. <laughs> so you are to run a, a course called preparing the channel. Oh, yes. So, and it can be, it might even be something that maybe you do live the first time, but then it's just all like digital that people will have to do, you know, it's almost like a prerequisite. I mean, people, it could be standalone mm -hmm. as well because it will be helpful for everyone, but it will include all of these things, you know, a lot of what you just said, but that in itself is a, is a program called preparing the channel. That is so wonderful. Thank you for that. Because, you know, Robin had the, the program long ago called prepared for corporate. And so this is very much <laughs> in alignment with the evolution of the brand as well. This is wonderful. Thank you for that. Selena, you're, you're the, you're my go-to for all of my program downloads. <laughs> I don't know why I'm like a weird, like, um, idiot savant when it comes to <laughs> the programs. Well, I they can explain come. that to you. <laughs> I can explain that to you if you would like me to. Yeah, we I will would do love part that. two. We'll do part two of the podcast where I explain Elise to herself <laughs> because I'm here for the channels. 
I'm here yes. for the channels. Yes. Yes. Okay. And Selena, I would love for you because I'm here for the channels. You and I know that Elise had um, was challenged when you came in, mm -hmm. challenged to fully receive you. So can you mm -hmm. talk us through, can you tell us the story of, from your perspective of what was required to be able to anchor in and integrate with Elise's consciousness now that you share this beautiful vessel with her? Well, Elise had to let go of the places that she was being things for other people and being what other people needed her to be and her attachment to that. So that was a really big piece of it. And then also she had to, to get, had to get comfortable with the power and the bigness of this energy. And that's what we've really been integrating with her as she sits out on her deck at night. Um, Cause that's where uh, she really allows Selena to be fully in her body. And she just had to get really okay with being this big and um unapologetic we'll say with her energy and not uh needing to uh push anything down or hide anything for other people so that was the big um thing along with her um identity of being jewish being a mother like all of these things that um she felt were Mm. identities that may not go along with this so we had to we had to allow her to see that uh they it, it was all the same thing so can you talk so, please about the oil oh yes yes so um we've we've been telling elise from the beginning that um she needs to anoint herself with oil um all over her body and um the the word anoint actually means oil so it's a way of blessing yourself and the biggest thing the biggest lesson that Elise is being called to learn is um reverence for the self so really um holding herself in a high regard, anointing herself and uh, treating herself as a um, higher being, we'll say. So that's been the biggest thing that we've been sharing with her is how to hold herself in this way, because it's a new way of being for her. And it's a, it's a, it's a big learning curve. <laughs> And do you remember when we were talking about um, the um, the miracle of the oil from? Oh yes, yes, yes. And interestingly enough, we just finished with Hanukkah, which is you know the Jewish uh, holiday around the miracle of the oil. And the story is that you know they only had enough oil for one day to have light for one day. And it ended up lasting for eight days. And it was a miracle. And, you know, the oil is, is a conductor of energy. So the oil on the body, uh, it, it helps with the conductive energy that wants to conduct the energy that wants to come through oh, the yes. body. Yes. So the oil acts as a conductor so that you can more easily receive information that oh, wants yes. to come through. This is wonderful to know. I, this is, this is of course Marisol because Robin is having <laughs> this realization when she was a teenager, she grew up in the eighties and it was baby oil all over the body in the summertime to lay in the sun. Oh yeah. But yeah. now, because whenever Robin would lay in the sun in the summertime, that was when I would come in and she would have the oil on her body. And so that would be a conductor and she would always feel so delicious after mm -hmm. being in the sunshine, whereas other people would be sunburned or whatever. She would just have this natural glow about her. So thank you for sharing that, Selena. And as far as business, the business of channeling, mm -hmm. what... What is, let's dial it in even, 
um, for the next 90 days or so, what is the focus for those who have healing businesses who feel called to channel, who are preparing to You want to, to be the, the way that you're going to call people forth into your business um, in the new paradigm of business is through frequency, but it's up to you to emanate your frequency in the most potent and powerful way. So what would really be great to focus on is anywhere where you might be watering yourself down, anywhere where you might be mm, masking the truth or trying to be more, uh, palatable or understood by other people. So that uh, will uh, make your frequency not as potent. So one of the things that we've shown Elise is about creating frequency emanating content, which is what she will be helping others to do as well. But this is how you're going to find people. So um, the more that you can share from your most potent, unadulterated frequency will be the way that you will call people forward. And the other thing is too, is you have to remember to lead the energy in your business. The mistake that a lot of people make is that they, they, wait for a response to decide how they're going to feel about the business, but they have to decide how they're going to feel regardless of the response. So this is a paradigm shift that people will need to make in business. And the quicker that everyone can do that, the quicker that they will move forward. So we need to be moving from a place of um, decision, deciding what's going to happen, and how you're going to feel about it first. So we have to be working with the energy of deciding, deciding what you're going to experience and deciding how you're going to feel in the business. And wherever you may be getting caught in a loop, a pattern, a loop, you are being invited to elevate beyond it. And that's what needs to happen. And I see that happening much more easily for people in January. So we just had the new moon on the mm -hmm. 15th. We're mm -hmm. coming up on the winter solstice. What is the best use of our energy, attention, and focus between now and the first of the year? Mm. You want to be spending a lot of time without a lot of uh, stimulation. So we often will have Elise stare out the window. And, and if you, you know, also if it's cold outside, so staring out the window is good, but if you can go outside, <laughs> that's better. It is, um, it is 75 degrees here in Arizona today. So you can always come to Arizona and be in the sunshine with me. Yes, I would love that. In fact, we've been showing Elise that she will write her book in February and she might need to do that in Sedona, but mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're moving. We're, uh, we're leading up to that. Mm -hmm. whatever that means we're leading up to that so so anyway uh staring at the trees watching the squirrels uh watching the birds and allowing your eyes to focus on simple things this will be very helpful in recalibrating your nervous system and um bringing you back into yourself because that's going to be the biggest thing. Um, one of the things that's important to just notice too is the frequencies that come off of the screens. They will uh, put you into patterns of um, not feeling good enough, feeling uh, less than, feeling uh, 
not whole. So we want to be aware of that too and take it in small doses, especially right now, because if you sit in, in silence or contemplation or any time where you're giving yourself space, you will get uh, bigger ideas and more information and creative inspiration coming through. This is so beautiful, Selena. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thanks for asking. We are going to have so much fun together next year. <laughs> I'm going to be writing my book and on my birthday, I start it. And you're writing in February. So we mm -hmm. will see what comes forward in the new year. Well, we could talk forever. And I know, I can't believe we've been talking this long. Yeah, so <laughs> congratulations if you have stayed with us all this time. <laughs> My podcast editor is probably going to be like, can we do this in two episodes? No, we're going to yeah. do one episode because it is that valuable. So thank you all for joining us and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you.